All this is going to change now. I'm really pleased to have uh, Rachel tell us, uh, give us a survey about program of skating. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Um, I've given many talks on program of prosecution when the organizer asked me that they said they should be a survey. And then I saw in the program, it's called a tutorial. If it were a tutorial, I didn't, I would not need to make new slides because they told me it's a survey, I made new slides. So I feel it's very important to stress, underline that it's a survey. <laughs> okay. All right. So. The general goal of a, of a vestation as outlined nearly half a century ago by Diffie and Hellman is that whether we can efficiently compile a program that may have lots of knowledge and the secrets inside into an equivalent version, which computes the same function, but now it hides the secrets. And this transformation from the clear program to the, what we call the fascinated program is what we are after, and we call it an fascinator. It is a randomized efficient algorithm. We of course want the, two, the fascinator program to be exactly the same as the original program in terms of function, that they compute the same output for every input. But at the same time, we want the fascinator program to be unintelligible. Well, this is intuitive to think about, but what does it really mean formally? So there's actually quite a bit of a struggle trying to come arrive at the right definition. I'm gonna present you the path. The first thing we would want when we intuitively think about a fast is that I wanted the fast program to act like a virtual black box, that it turns white box access to a program to the black box access to a program. That's a security definition. Having the code reveals no more information than the input output behavior. This is rather really, really strong, but also very natural and desirable. And if that were the case, then we can deduce a lot of nice security properties. In particular, the FASTED program would hide any secrets that cannot be efficiently learned from the input output behavior. How do we really use this? Why do we want it? Because we can immediately think about of fascinating natural programs. For example, uh, software vulnerability patches that we, want, we would like to fascinate them so that attackers would not see the patch and actually realize what the attack is, where the vulnerability is. We might want to fascinate programs with copyright protection information inside. We might want to fascinate machine learning models for privacy or various reasons. In crypto, there's also very natural use. This was originally envisioned by Defi and Hellman is that if I have program fascination, then I can convert any secret key encryption scheme into a public key encryption scheme. For example, we would love to convert AES into a public key encryption scheme. All what we need to do is to hard code the secret key for the AES inside this fascinated program. And what the program provides is the ability to convert input and randomness into AES ciphertext, okay? And this fascinated program itself is going to be the public key, okay? If the program really acts as a virtual black box, then having access to this public key is no different than uh, sort of just seeing examples of encryptions. And such a program would also be really useful, much more powerful than just getting basic cryptographic primitives. It can be used to, to achieve really advanced crypto goals. For example, we can enable computation over encrypted data. Think about uh, how do we do that? We can just give a, a third party processor on an fascinated program, which hard codes the right decryption key. And the program when is given a cipher text is going to internally decrypt using the key and then do the right computation we would like it to do. Finally, re-encrypt, right? With this program, this processor, without knowing the key, without knowing what's being encrypted, can just do computation. And this is a concept called fully homomorphic encryption, extremely powerful. But using program obfuscation, we can also 
easily get new functionality. For example, I can decide to not re-encrypt some parts of the output of the computation and just let it out in the clear. In that case, it gives a different primitive called a functional encryption, where it allows to give out outputs for specific functions. And we can also combine them. Okay, so this virtual black box framework is really, really powerful. How can we formalize it? Well, how can we say that an the program looks like the input output behavior? They're really like completely different objects. But in crypto, we have the language of simulation where we can require to say there exists a universal simulator that is given with as input some parameter of the program, for example, its size, input length, and only black box access to the function. <clears throat> and that such a simulator is able to produce a simulated affascinated program, which I, we call p hat, in a way that is indistinguishable from the actual affascinated program. Well, if that were the case, intuitively really says the affascinated program leaks no more information than whatever the simulator has. And the simulator has only black box access to the program. Great. Unfortunately, it's quick to see that this notion is just wonderful, but really impossible in general, because I can't expect the simulator to learn arbitrary programs from the input output behavior. There is a strong harness in learning programs. So this notion is impossible. How can we weaken it so that it becomes possible? <coughs> A first attempt is to say, okay, uh, we're not gonna aim for sort of universal simulation of the affascinated program, but let's think about more specific tasks. Perhaps there is, I just want to fool those attackers, which is trying to learn some predicate about the original program from the affascinated program. In that case, Perhaps there exists a simulator that now depends on the polynomial time attacker, such that the, for any program, the simulator is going to simulate the bit of information the attacker learns using only Oracle access to the black box access to the program. Now, this is a weaker definition, and it still kind of is trying to capture the spirit that a faster program acts like a black box, right? Except that it uh, sort of uh, hides less information. Is this possible? Unfortunately, that uh, the great work by Barack et al. showed that this is still in general impossible. In fact, there exists a certain self-eating programs that cannot be DBB obfuscated. And so our dream is again crashed. Then they proposed an even weaker definition that kind of abandons this dream of having only turning white box access to black box access. Now it says, okay, in crypto, other than simulation, we have indistinguishability. We're going to only require that if we started with two programs that are really functionally identical, I mean, other parameters are also the same. They have the same size, the same input behavior, or the same input length. So basically you can sort of differentiate them from the black box access. Then the fast program should now become indistinguishable to any polynomial time attackers. So if you think about it, what does this version of security hide? We're kind of saying that it's hiding any implementation differences between two implementation of the same function, right? So if I started with these two polynomials as my program, that they really compute the same polynomial but are implemented differently, then seeing the facility program does not tell me which version it was. Now, we can view this 
a facet program in some sense as a pseudo canonicalizer for programs, right? It canonicalizes all the programs that compute the same function. And viewed this way, it's easy to see that it's actually easy to achieve if P equals to NP, because all what I need to do is given the program, the fast gator is going to search for the lexicographically first program that implements the same function and output that one. Amazingly, we showed that the community showed that if P does not equal to NP, in particular, NP is not an infinitely often BPP, then IO implies most of the cryptographic goals that we want to achieve. And hence, it is sort of viewed as a master tool. What we're going to do today is a three part. Yeah. Uh, basically, one way functions or anything equal to One way functions, yeah. And then there's another work show that NP not infinitely often BPP and IO implies one way function. Okay, so we're going to see three parts. The first part is a mini tutorial on IO from well studied assumptions. And now we're going to survey what else is going on. Part two, we're going to see how we're going to go beyond IO despite the fact that we've abandoned uh, the, I, the dream of IDRO and the VPP of obfuscation. And in part three, we're going to see some challenges in achieving post quantum security. All right, so given that IO is so powerful, that it's no strange that the community has worked really a lot trying to get it. The first generation, starting from the great work of Garg et al, tried to build it from this algebraic object to call the multilinear maps. And soon after that, they just kind of exploded with different approaches using multilinear map. People also explored non multilinear map based constructions using different cryptographic objects or math object. The common theme, however, the unsatisfactory point in all these construction is somewhere in the construction, they're going to rely on some heuristic in the form of some newly conjectured hardness assumptions. And <laughs> Unfortunately, also that subsequently there have been attacks on those new assumptions or new constructions. So this kind of like goes back to this repair and attack games that cryptographers really want to avoid. Our goal is to not have those circles of repair and attacks and just build things from well-studied assumptions and be done. And this is indeed what we did with Ayush Jain here and Amisha. Hi, unfortunately not here. That uh, in two works, we build IO from three assumptions. One is the learning parity with noise, generalized to over larger field FP. Usually we talk about this assumption over F2, but you can naturally generalize it. The second is the existence of local PRGs. So the random generator that can be computed by NC0 circuits. Finally is this polynomial stretch. polynomial stretch, exactly. We're actually come to this point, yeah. The third is a bilinear map where we rely on a fairly standard assumption over a bilinear map, which is decision linear assumption. All these assumptions needs to be sub-exponentially hard in the sense that the advantage of a polynomial time attacker is sub-exponentially small. These assumptions we consider are well studied because they've already kind of arise in the crypto community in the, in the past and have been used for building um, crypto tools that are unrelated to IO at all before. And then they all have their connection to other fields, like LPN has the connection to coding theory, PRG has the connection to constraint satisfaction problems in complexity theory, bilinear maps has its connection with algebra and number theory. 
So I want to give you a taste <coughs> about how this theorem is proven, but keep in mind that everything is rather informal, okay? And very high level. So let's think about the task of building IO, where we're trying to come up with some sort of encoding, whatever that encoding is, of a program, such that given this encoding, if I want to evaluate a specific input X, there is a way, there is some sort of circuit that I can apply on the encoding with this X in the clear that will produce me Y. And why is it difficult? Because this problem is rather overwhelming that if I want to obfuscate general circuits, the evaluation procedure to compute a single X is very, very complex, right? And in order for program obfuscation security to hold, I really need to make sure all the intermediate computation steps, the results are hidden. And I only wanted the output of the computation to be revealed. Right? Suppose any intermediate computation steps out value is revealed. This is additional information about the program beyond the output. And I don't want that to, to, be, uh, to be revealed. Now it's really hard to think about what kind of encoding is gonna enable me to compute very, very, very high degree, very complex computation and the high the order intermediate evaluation outcome and magically only reveal the final output. So the basic idea is to say that we're gonna do some massaging of this computation so that <coughs> I turn it into a different computation that only an intermediate crucial step of just degree two needs to be hidden and everything else can be just computed in the public. As long as this degree two step is hidden, we can guarantee that the program pi is hidden, uh, not uh, beyond the output. Why degree two? Why not degree one? Why not degree three? Well, it's because that in crypto, we have this uh, nice object called a bilinear map. Uh, they're actually used which allows us to compute degree two polynomials over secret values. Okay, so you can encode inputs using bilinear map. And on this encoding, I can compute a degree two polynomial in a completely secure way. And we don't have degree three linear maps and uh, that's degree two is what we're stuck with. And the degree one you can easily show is insufficient. You had SHE, then you could do anything. No, the point is that bilinear map allow you to evaluate degree two polynomial on encoding of secrets and obtain the outcome in the clear. SHE will not allow you to obtain the outcome in the clear. Everything is encrypted. Now, how can I do this, right? This seems to be really magical that I used to need to hide every step in the computation. Now I just hide this degree too. Actually, a lot of crypto has focused on this problem. So our first step is using just standard cryptography, we can convert this computation into two-step computation, where the first step I called is a hide function depending on uh, input X, which will produce some intermediate encoding of the program and from which we can decode to obtain the outcome Y. It's important that this intermediate encoding as we want really only allows revealing the output of the program on a single input and hide all the other information. And hence it can be sort of, all can be viewed as kind of a special encryption of the program. Well, this is actually, we know how to do this all along. This is basically the concept of randomized encoding, uh, which can be implemented using double circuits or randomized polynomials, right? Because all what I want is to encode a program with a single input together that reveals only the output. So if you don't know about double circuit, just know that this is something quite standard. 
if you think about that, this is really magical <coughs> because I did not really reduce the complexity of the computation, which is impossible to do from a complex theoretic point of view. I just I just revealed which part needs to be hidden. Which reduced part? which part needs to be hidden. So you know about garble circuits, and I'm not sure I'm following where they come in here. So like, do you like garble the circuit and then you give it, or are you what what is happening? You can use always a garbled version of the program and also a garbled input. Okay. Think about it that way. Yeah. Okay. This only needs a one-way function. Huh? So this only needs a one-way function. Yes. Okay. And then we somehow give, um, like, when we give the opposite, uh, opposite program, we give the give whoever is evaluating it the ability to obfuscate inputs on its own. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now let's look into this uh, thing that I claim to be very standard. <laughs> it turns out that if you want to do this, clearly any sort of encryption, this is a special encryption, but any sort of encryption requires randomness, right? We don't have secrecy if we don't have randomness. And hence, I need some kind of pseudo-random generator to produce pseudo-random coins in order to produce the special encryption. So oh, pseudo random generator we're familiar with. So here we require the crypto version, which is it has polynomial stretch and is indistinguishable to random for all polynomial time attackers. The question is, well, I want the, the hidden part to be as simple as possible to be so simple that it's degree two. Now, can I even generate pseudo random strings in degree two? Unfortunately, we've tried and tried, we actually failed. We don't have any candidate that is secure. What's the best do we have? What we have is from complexity theory, there are those local pseudo-random generators proposed by Goldrach around 2000. And they're basically uh, says that the function is local in the sense every output bit depends on a constant number of input bits. And we have candidates where the locality is just five and the five is the minimum, pro probably the minimum. Any locality five program can be converted into a degree five polynomial. So this means that I can compute PRG in degree five, but not in degree two. All right, so let's come back. Basically, we saw that we have randomized encoding that allows us to drastically reduce which part we need to hide. Now, I just need to hide the PRG evaluation and following that, the randomized encoding computation. But we don't know how to handle this kind of computation either because we can only handle degree two. So we need more, more simplification. So the crucial step in our work is to show that if I started with a local computation, I can actually further convert it into a new computation where now only a degree two step needs to be hidden using some public preprocessing. What is the thing that I have described more formally? Let's start with a function f that is local constant local, we show that assuming learning parity with noises over larger fields, we can convert any local function into what we call degree 2.5 polynomial. We don't call it that, I call it that. <laughs> what is degree 2.5? Basically, there's only a degree two part that needs to be hidden. How so? There is a way to convert any input x into two parts. Q and S. The first part can be just public because it actually hides the input X. The second part reveals the input X, hence must be kept a secret. The nice part is that the computation, as I said, the computation can never really, I can never reduce the complexity of the computation ever. So the nice part is that we allow the computation on the public part to have constant degree. In fact, they will have the same degree as the original function f. And only the computation on the secret part 
has the constraint to have degree two only. So this kind of computation can always be written as a special polynomial, which is quadratic in the secret input, and it multiplied with coefficients that it depends on the public input. And the coefficient can be computed using constant degree polynomials from the public input. Additionally, I need some succinctness property, right? Because this is very easy to do. If my converted input is allowed to be as long as the output, then I can do it a secret degree, which is zero. <laughs> so what I want is that as we do the conversion, the new input is still sublinear in the length of the output. That makes it non-trivial. I won't really tell you how this conversion works. This is sort of the key in the, in the two papers. But I'll tell you that what is the secret component that really enabled it, which is this assumption of learning parity with noise. What this assumption says is, given a secret factor S, multiplied with a public matrix A, if I just give out S times A, it's very easy to solve for the secret S. However, it starts to become hard if I corrupt the output using just some sparse errors, where the sparsity means that most of the elements in the error is zero, except for inverse polynomial fraction of the locations, it will be a random element from ZP. So this sort of like a decoding random linear code. <coughs> the assumption is that with this corrupted output, it will look pseudo random. And if you think about this, basically it looks the same as the learning with error assumption, except that the noise distribution is different. Why did we actually prefer this version while well, learning with error in fact, it has to show much more like flexibility in enabling applications. The key point is that learning parity with noise will give me some kind of homomorphic encryption for very limited functions, only enable computing local functions in a homomorphic way. But local is enough. The nice part is the noise is sparse, meaning that the noise can be compressed Right? Remember that I want my conversion to produce compressed input, which is sublinear in the length of the output. And the compressed errors can always be expanded back to the full error. The magic is that it can be expanded back in just degree two. Okay? So this part is going to actually be done inside the degree two using multilinear map or using bilinear map. This last part about the error is compressible and can be expanded in degree two is why we use LPN. And we don't know how to do that using LWE. Okay, so now that uh, suppose you buy what I say that we have convert the computation into this way, how do we connect the dots finally? Is that we're gonna think about, we have a program which <clears throat> The computation is actually not input by input, but I'm just directly producing the entire truth table. This is the computation I'm gonna look at. Now, after the transformation, it says that I can obtain something which is sublinear in the output lens, which is sublinear in the lens of the truth table. This information is enough for me to expand out to the entire truth table. What this effectively give me is a rather very weak obfuscation where it only compresses the truth table length sublinearly. So the obfuscation in fact has size exponentially long, right? And the very nice sequence of work we have shown that I always, even such non-trivial time is enough to obtain I always full polynomial size. And if you're a complexity theorist, you will immediately think you have to use recursion, right? Most of the complexity result has recursion. <laughs> so what do we do? Well, we start with a two to the n size truth table and this input length. 
We cut it into tiny pieces. Each of it is polynomial size. We compress each of the piece into sublinear size. Now this is a smaller truth table. And I keep compressing until I get polynomial size of classification. So this is the high level picture behind the functional encryption to IO transformation. And we will actually come back to this later. All right, so this basically concludes my part one. And next I'm gonna go to the part two, which is beyond IO, what can we say still about IDRO and the VDD obfuscation? Remember that when we started exploring the concept of program obfuscation, this is really the dream version, right? This is what one would naturally think and naturally desire. But the question is why, given that we have IO and we have construction of IO, why do we still care about ideal obfuscation and VDB, right? They're impossible in general. And we've shown that IO is sufficient for most applications. Who cares? Well, I want to argue that actually we do still care. We should still care. One is that the impossibilities are carefully crafted and then there are really just a few examples. And hence in the space of all circuits, we have no idea that the majority of the circuits can be obfuscated or not. I have no idea. Maybe half of them can, half of them can't. Maybe most of them can, maybe most of them can't. We don't know, right? <laughs> Have to be careful to give talk. <laughs> Furthermore, though IO is very powerful in applications, it's mostly powerful for crypto applications. If you think about the space of all applications, crypto applications is just a small fraction. <laughs> See, that's what I said. Another good question. <laughs> Among the space of applications, for most crypto applications, we manage to salvage the situation using I.O., but there are still a few, like, uh, you know, uh, hard nuts left. <laughs> but for most natural applications, if you think about, I.O. is insufficient. And in fact, we would want IDRO and VBD obfuscation. I'll come back to talk about what those natural applications look like. In addition, that IDRO and VBD security, though impossible in general, it is really much stronger than IO. It is also, I would argue, more natural and definitely easier to use. And hence, in some sense, I view IO as a tool for experts. An idea of obfuscation and VDD is a tool for lesser experts. <laughs> I wanted to say it's a tool for non-experts, then I felt you're gonna object. <laughs> so I toned it down to say lesser experts. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if we think about we want the one day, and uh, you know, broadcast the power of a program obfuscation to the industry to the world beyond this room, then I would strongly argue we want ideal obfuscation and VDD. What are these natural applications? Well, these are the natural applications, not what a cryptographer would think about, but a software engineer would think about. Let's obfuscate vulnerability patch, copyright protection, machine learning models. Let's convert, actually convert AES into a public key encryption, not some uh, specific program based on injective PRGs using puncture the program technique. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's beautiful, I love it, but it's different, right? You see the difference. So for example, machine learning models has not of issue with privacy. People have already shown that from deep neural network, you can pull out people's credit card you can pull out people's image that belong to the training set. One idea is can we obfuscate a machine learning model, show that this model is actually black box private, and then hopefully, you know, there exists some obfuscation that obfuscated learning model is also going to be private. 
you think about such applications, even VVB is not clear whether it is sufficient, right? However, do I believe that there exists such an investigation that will make it private? Well, depends on your viewpoint. Certainly, IO seems insufficient for this kind of uh, applications. I'll talk about it in a second. Mm -hmm. Can you so, say why it seems insufficient? I just don't know. What does it guarantee? Like, can I can I now surgically modify the vulnerability patches? Can I surgically modify AES to make IO security proof go through? Maybe I can, but I maybe I don't want to, even if I can. Yeah. We didn't think IO was going to be good for anything. <laughs> I agree with you. It might be good for a lot of things and maybe also all, all of that. Even that, I think there is, it is nice if we don't have to surgically, you know, transform the program. Think about software engineer trying to investigate programs. Well, we don't have to think about it. They, they do it all the time. <laughs> they do it all the time. That's right. They don't need us. I have to worry too much. <laughs> we also state papers, research papers. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So if you are an optimist, if you're a pessimist, close your eyes. If you're an optimist, you believe in this natural heuristic, what I call, is that if I consider natural applications with natural security goals, then I believe there exists an investigation that suffice. This is called the natural heuristic. In fact, um, there are lots of works which shows that when we don't know how to use IO, but we know how to achieve a cryptographic goal using VBB or ideal investigation, then subsequently conjecture that for those natural programs, VVB and ideal obfuscation is achievable. And then you can think about it, instantiating it heuristically, right? But this is a word view. And this is a nice word view that I would like us to be believing in. The question is, can I actually have any justification for this natural heuristic, right? And know that this is complementary to the best possible heuristic that Shafi and the guy mentioned, like came up with many years ago. The best possible heuristic says that for an application, if I know that there exists an investigator that suffices, then IO is a good candidate for that investigator. It starts with an assumption that there is an investigator that suffice. And hence, it doesn't say anything about whether we should believe such a investigator exists or not. Okay. So how can we approach such a problem? Well, I already know that ideal investigation is impossible in the plain model. What we can show is perhaps it's possible in some Oracle model. And with Daniel uh, G. Ruo and Ayush, we show that assuming functional encryption for circuits, which can be built from well-studied assumptions, in fact, it's just pre-normal time harness of those assumptions, we can actually achieve ideal obfuscation in a new model called pseudo-random Oracle model, which is a variant of the random Oracle model. And furthermore, we believe that, we believe, we think it's reasonable, that in natural applications, we can instantiate the pro with just real world hash functions, like what we do uh, with the random Oracle heuristic. So what this theorem is saying is that if you believe pseudo random Oracle pro heuristic, then we have justification for the natural heuristic that we believe that we live in a world where most natural programs and natural applications have a valid obfuscation. You first have to get them to write a proper one on random oracles. 
How does Okay. How does it not contradict the, the counter example, the impossibility of implication? Yes. If it exists, how can you believe in a... The well, so the Morocco model, model also has counter examples. There are examples of application. You cannot instantiate the random Oracle using any real world hash function, but yet we use random Oracle heuristic. We believe that in natural applications that are not Artificial Focus is natural. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah but, but, but how do you know if your program is natural or not? Huh? You know, when you want to obfuscate a program. You don't have a characterization, just like in the random oracle heuristic. But when you look at an application, if you see that it is natural, you know it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's not the application, it's the program, right? Right. Yeah, it's if you see AES, AES is a natural program. It's not a program that People have, you know, <laughs> done this. So why you don't you publish a candidate, um, a candidate um, public key encryption method based on AES? Because it's not fast enough <laughs> so far. Hopefully one day it will be fast well, enough. Well, but, but because you leave in your work, you're basically saying, okay, use I.O. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can, and the real world functions. You won't justify it like we do it now. Yeah, so that's true. Yeah, but still no fast yeah. enough. Okay, yeah. this part is going to be controversial. I have to do some time management, and then I'm very happy to talk with you offline. But uh, let can I, can I move on? Because you need to see the model, right? Aren't you curious? I just, just, just doesn't understand what you're saying <laughs> philosophically. Why is it different to instantiate which are as opposed to instantiate with IO? That's best possible. I don't understand philosophically why it's different from best possible. I, we're, I'll talk with you about it. Maybe it would be very happy if we could get the same BBB obfuscation or ideal obfuscation in the random work model. Ran Yael and uh, yeah. Homer, right? Uh, they wrote the paper saying it's impossible. So Rachel would show us some augmentation of the logic. But to answer your question quickly, tell him afterwards I'm not going to ask any more questions. <laughs> Is that if you believe that a particular program can be obfuscated in a very strong way, then best of possible says just use IO as a good candidate. But do we believe that a particular program can be obfuscated in a strong way? Suppose, imagine, ideally, the lower bound that the Yao and the Omer and the Ran show didn't exist, that we actually can build ideal obfuscation using the random oracle. Then what do you believe? You believe that, I mean, from the random oracle heuristic, you give me justification that natural program can be obfuscated in a VBB way, right? So it's different, different parts of the argument. All right. So what is this oracle? This oracle says that this is oracle that it it has two kinds of interface. One is an initiator, an initiator can choose our PRF or the oracle is parameterized with a pseudo random function h. Can choose a PRF key, send it to the Oracle and say, please create the public handle for this key. The Oracle is going to remember the key K and map it using some random permutation, or you can also think about just a, a list of mappings to some random public handle. Now it returns this public handle to the initiator. Now, the initiator can broadcast this public handle. Anybody who has the handle, we call this person evaluators, is able to submit the handle and say, please evaluate, and the input X, say, please evaluate at input X. And the Oracle is going to find out what is the public, what is the private PRF key it has remembered and evaluates the PRF function on this key and this input and return only the output. Okay, so this oracle captures two access to the PRF function HK star. If a user knows only the public handle, can only kind of submit evaluation queries on arbitrary input and obtain the corresponding output. 
in this case, from this user's perspective, it just kind of looks like a random oracle, right? However, if a user knows the key K, the initiator, then it does have code access to this function H of K star, right? It knows the code. So clearly the power of the pseudo random oracle, if we were to achieve anything beyond the random oracle, crucially relies on the fact that there are these two uh, different access to the function. Daniel looks rather unhappy, are you? <laughs> oh, okay. So any application needs to really use both, right? But here's a weird part, which is we know if the key K ever exists in the system, information theoretically exists, then the output of the PRF function with that key K is not pseudo random. So how do I use these two things together? So a general recipe is the initiator who is going to, you can think about it as the fast gator, is going to create a public handle, announce it, and then it can use the key K in a hidden way. Can do some, can FHE the key K, can gobble circuit with the K hard coded inside, it can do functional encryption, encrypt the key K. Now, additionally, the attacker can also always query. This attacker, you can think about as the evaluator in the IO world, in the program investigation world. It can also ask arbitrary input output, right? How do we, at this point, because the key K exists information theoretically, I can't argue that the output is pseudo random, right? Um, so what we can do is to use the crypto. It's because the key K is never given in the clear, it's given in a hidden way. Therefore, I can use the FHE, double circuit or whatever tool security to say that to move to a hybrid where these parts are simulated using just a few output points. Now, since the key has disappeared from the attacker's view, we can now switch the pseudo random function to a random function. And this allows me to, in this hybrid world, to just use the random oracle with the attacker. So here's how we can use the pro model, which is you can never give out the key K in the clear because then what's the point? All the PRF outputs are going to be non pseudo random, but we can use the key K in a hidden way that in hybrid, we're gonna remove it and allow me to use random oracle in argument. So also note that either in some hybrid, the key K exists, and we're not, the code access exists, and we're not using the random oracle at all, or in some hybrid, the key K has been removed and we rely, we can rely on random oracle. So these two things never coexist in the security proof. How do we instantiate the pro model? We just use SHA, right? The code access turns into SHA evaluation, the handle, which is counterintuitive, but we're just gonna give out the code of SHA and the key K itself. And any Oracle evaluation also turns into now an evaluation of SHA. What's the rationale? If you think about the random Oracle heuristic, it is really saying that given the code of the hash function, all what the attacker can do is the input output looks random, looks like the out, looks like a random function. This is effectively saying the hash function acts like a self-obfuscated PRF. Already in the random oracle instantiation, every oracle call is going to be replaced with the code of the hash function anyway yet we are pretending that the output looks random. So morally, it doesn't seem like Pro is asking much more. 
then what the random or random oracle heuristic is already asking. Yeah. Can you interpret this result as like a completeness result? If we could obfuscate a pseudo random function, then yes. we can obfuscate anything. Yes. Okay. All right. So uh, how do we model this? When we want to construct ideal obfuscation now in the Oracle world, the obfuscator has access to the Oracle and then we'll produce an Oracle program. And the evaluator to evaluate it needs to use an Oracle, right? And now we can really ask for ideal security, which there exists a universal simulator, which given Oracle access to the program can produce an Oracle program. Now, the magic is that the simulator gets to simulate the Oracle for the attacker. Right. And it can simulate the Oracle for the attacker with access to, with black box access to the program. And this is the key for circumventing the lower bound because it used to be that the simulator to win must learn a short representation of the program. But now it doesn't need to because it might potentially just use its Oracle calls to manage to fool the attacker when the attacker tries to evaluate the function, the evaluate the program. All right, so as you have discussed already that the prior work has already thought about this question in some sense, maybe in a different format. For example, we have results, which is a fast bootstrapping, aiming at showing that I just need to obfuscate to certain simple circuits O that are in NC0, uh, in NC1 or TC0, then I will be able to obfuscate any polynomial uh, size circuit. How complex are those Oracle O? Well, there are results showing you just need to do FH decryption, but you also need to be able to verify that the ciphertext that it decrypts is really the valid homomorphic evaluation outcome on the FHE of the circuit. Or you can ask the Oracle O to compute randomized encoding of the circuit for a particular input using pseudo random outputs. Anyways, the fine prints are not very important, but these oracles are still fairly complex. And in particular, it depends on the circuit C. I'll handle questions after the talk. Sorry. Okay. All right. But what we would like to have is a simple oracle independent of the circuit that is sufficient for us to, to obfuscate any circuit. And there we only had the prior impossibility results. Basically, we said random oracle, not useful. Constant degree multilinear map, not useful. If you go to polynomial degree multilinear map, then very useful, but that also gets very complex. We don't know how to heuristically instantiate. So now we show it's possible to use Pro. I'm not sure I have time to go through the technical ideas, so I'm going to skip that. Uh, it's directly to the, since it's a survey, I want to go to the last part, which is, the challenge towards post-quantum security. Um, the theorems in those works has three assumptions, and one of them, which is the bilinear map, is easy to solve using quantum computations. So this is a grand challenge of how can we remove this bilinear map or just do things completely differently based on assumptions that are post-quantum secure. So two questions. For the previous construction, oh, do you need these assumptions as well? Yes. The assumption is that there exists a functional encryption for circuits. So you just need polynomial version of these assumptions. What's the state of the art? Here are some of the, we have constructions which uh, has been with us uh, where they are not probably secure from any simple to state assumption. 
And therefore, security is assumed as is. They are based on high degree multilinear map or heuristic construction based on affine determinant programs or tensor products. And there has been some attacks on the first two style of construction. Overall, that we should say that some constructions are broken and some constructions are not broken explicitly by attacks. There's a generic generalization course that if you apply any of these constructions on top of it, then none is broken, right? Yeah, I feel believe. Uh, yeah, sure. <coughs> the problem is it is that for these works, it tries to directly obfuscate the circuits, invent a way to do that from scratch. And sometimes that it's just too complex to analyze. Now, more recently, there has been a line of work tries to build candidate constructions that are proven secure from simple to state assumptions. It started with the, the BDGM works, which they give a heuristic construction based on FHE with leakage. And these works still don't have any proof yet. However, following that, there are two works formulated concrete assumptions, which will give uh, post quantum secure IO. And more recently, that we have work that formulated a fully specified assumption that will imply post quantum security. So, these first two, these middle two works um, is more like a framework of assumptions where there are unspecified parameters inside, or attacker has some ability to choose some functions in the security game. Whereas this one is fully specified. You know the distribution that you're looking at and it's an indistinguishability assumption. What we have shown is that there is a polynomial time attack on the subspace flooding assumption. And there are counter examples, meaning when you instantiate choosing certain parameter, the unspecified parameters in a special way, then we can attack these, uh, these assumptions. So overall, basically, we don't have um, candidates that are based on simple to state assumption that don't have any nearby attack. The general paradigm behind the attacks, which is also the difficulty of trying to construct IO based on learning with errors is that Usually what they do is that they give out those uh, uh, LWE samples. LWE is very powerful, in particular, it would enable fully homomorphic encryption. So you could imagine that we can do arbitrary computation. However, everything is in an encrypted form. So if you want to learn the output in the end, you need to enable that. To enable that, they give out some leakage about the LWE secrets. This is the leakage hopefully allow you to do controlled decryption, right? And this is also the part that creates problem. Because when you give out leakage, it automatically translates itself into leakage on the noise. So all the attacks exploit the fact that you can collect equations over LWE noise. In particular, they are equations over the integers. And after you get lots of equations, you can attempt, they're not necessarily the linear equations, but you can attempt to linearize it and then solve for the noise. Or you can try to distinguish using certain statistical tests. What is really open, and I think a good question, is to find LWE with leakage assumptions that are sufficient for IO, but with justification for harness, at least against known attacks, certain classes of attacks. Okay, so that's it. Uh, what are the challenges? There are really, really lots of challenges in this space. And I think we need really good new ideas. For example, can we have weaker assumptions? Forget about post-quantum security. Removing any assumption is good. Or coming up with different work that uses different, different set of assumptions. Post-quantum security <laughs> is a big problem. And I think that the near the medium goal is to just get candidate from simple to state assumption that don't have nearby attacks and this 
we might not be able to achieve in one step, but we need to allow a little bit trial of error and still with new assumptions proposed. And recently we have construction of now IO based on a new assumption, which is called evasive RWE. And a question is, can we modify? One is you approach from the above this, the other is you approach from the bottom. This is what we know how to do. Can we get bigger classes of circuits? Uh, for example, can we do evasive circuits? Can we do this uh, subspace hiding circuits, which is very interesting for the post for the quantum community? Efficiency is a big problem. I didn't manage to show you, but at least I show you the recursive approach. This recursive approach is never going to be efficient. However, if you think about it, that when we first had PRF with the, the GGM trees, which is very similar to currently the FE to IO recursion, later on, money, for example, give algebraic constructions directly for the PRF that are much more efficient than using the tree structure. Can we do something similar here to get rid of this transformation? Beyond the IO, what more can we say about ideal and the visibility of uh, I really think that sometimes that uh, negative uh, results has the undesirable effect of completely dampening research on a particular object. And uh, we should really do more on this because the security is the most desirable. Okay, thank you. Over time, we can take a couple of pieces. Is that yeah, but that's the part of something that's quite old. Is that annoying for you? And then you have IO for free, and then I'm going to show you. Yeah, but it, you're saying if P not equals to MP, then. But well, is there any level of form if IO exists? There's something. Ilya will talk about it, right? Yes, I don't want to self promote, but wait until my talk. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, you had the three simple to state assumptions, and then you focused on the one that's broken by quantum computers. But if I only care about classical computers, which assumption do you think is weak? I cannot answer this question because I am not a crypto analyst, and I have no idea. <laughs> yes, yes. And any answer I will give you is based on that feeling. And actually, this is a good point. I do want to point out. I feel that any removing any assumption is extremely valuable. Oftentimes I hear people from different communities say different things. For example, complexity community seems to be totally fine with local PRGs. Crypto community like less than local PRGs, some people. They prefer the algebraic assumptions like LPN, or they might think that LWE is the right answer. Well, Sometimes I feel these kind of ideas come from popularity rather than really is based on how hard the assumptions are. I suppose that uh, anybody who has written a paper based on LWE believe in LWE that clearly LWE has a lot of votes, but it doesn't necessarily say anything about how hard LWE is. The structure may actually be a curse comparing with LPN, yeah. right? So I think we want to not confuse these things together. I am not a crypto analyst, uh, so I can't say, but I just think that removing any assumptions is good. So thanks, Rachel, for the amazing talk. Uh, <laughs> thanks for, promo, for the promo for the assumptions panel, which will be today at 4.15. <laughs> and, and during the break, you have enough time to write an email to a crypto analyst, and then when you get the answer, <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Yes, so I you, she's way more of an expert in, in assumptions.